Hey, Ashley, guess what? What? I closed the deal today. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I closed the deal. Um, yeah, awesome deal. Big hurry, though. They're in a big hurry. Really great company. Yeah, um, that's great. Could you tell me a little bit more about this company? Uh, well, um, well, I did get on their site a little bit, and they, I think they sell, like, sports shoes or something. It seems like a pretty big company, and... Um, yeah, they're e-commerce, but, but they're in a big hurry, so, yep. All right. Um, could you get me some information about this company? Is there, like, any summary? Like, you're yeah. telling me they're in a hurry? Is yeah, there I mean, a timeline somewhere? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the normal, right? Like, you look on Dropbox, just do a search in your computer, Dropbox, and then uh, we got them on Google Drive, so I've got a few documents spread out there. And let me see. Uh, I, I think I've, a couple emails I'll forward to you so you can read through those, too, Okay. Oh, but but okay. listen, actually, um, you, you do need to read those in the next couple of hours because I told them that we'd be kicking off like later today because like they're in a big hurry and I don't want them to, I don't I don't want them to drop like drop out. Kyle, why would you do that? Why would you tell this client that I'm going to talk to them today for a kickoff? You know that I schedule my time and the team's time like weeks in advance. Of course I can't just pull everybody together, read some documentation, and be at a client call in a couple hours. Yeah. Um, well, Ashley, I, I know we have this conversation pretty often. And, um, like, the truth of the matter is that I've got to sell. Like, we have to eat as a company, so i got to sell, right? So sometimes that means we move a little faster. Sometimes it means we have a little more time, and you guys just need to roll with it. Oh, we have to roll with it. I see. Um, so where did you say this documentation was? Yeah, so um, just the normal spots. You know, search it out. And um, listen, I got to go. I got another call. I have a really hot client. Um, really looking forward to this. I think I'll close another deal here in the next week. And uh, just make sure you send me the stuff for the invite, the kickoff call tonight. Great. Awesome. Does, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Does that type of interaction sound familiar to any of you? So hopefully not quite to that extent, maybe not as dramatic. But then again, you did choose to come to this, to this session, so presumably you want to hear how you might improve the transition from your sales to your project team. So that's great. That means that you're in the right place because that's what we're going to talk to you about. But first, a little bit about ourselves. Yeah, so I'm Kyle Theobald. Um, I've been in sales for about, well, web sales for about five years now, maybe six. I started in the Magento space working in e-commerce and then moved on to Drupal through Commerce Guys to, to BlueSpark. So I um, have had a bit of experience working with project managers over the years. I'm Ashley Tavene. Um, I'm director of operations at BlueSpark. I started as project manager and still manage some projects. Um, I've kind of changed my responsibility a bit over the years, but I've been with uh, BlueSpark for about five years now. And before that, I actually worked on the client side. Um, I was e-commerce manager for a jewelry brand, so I do kind of have the experience from the other side as well, not just you know in an agency. Yeah, awesome. So quick poll, um, how many project managers are there in this room? Okay, good, and uh, any salespeople are brave enough to show up? <laughs> a few, awesome. You guys unfortunately are the brunt of the joke today, so. Uh... <laughs> How about any uh, like non-agency folks? Awesome. Yep. Okay. Thanks for coming. All right. Let's continue with our little poll. Um, has anybody here ever experienced a difficult transition from their sales to project team? All right. Lots of hands. Have you ever had a project go awry because of a difficult transition? Still some hands. Definitely. <laughs> All right, and have you ever had a frustrated client or frustrated team members because of something that went wrong in a transition? All right, so by the miracles of modern technology, we have just graphed the results of that informal poll <laughs> instantaneously, and you will see that everybody has experienced this type of difficult transition, at least at one point in their careers. So, you know, 
that's great. That means you're not alone. We've all had these type of issues before. And even so, you may be asking yourselves, you know, why should we care? Yeah, so why should we care? Is it really important that sales and, and the project management office work together? Is it okay for sales to just do their thing and then turn over the projects and get things started? Um, so a quick little story of my own that happened a, a couple years ago. I just started with a new company in the Magento space and um, sold a project to a company called Pickett's, uh, Pickett's Press. Um, they were a bespoke like card creation company. And um, <clears throat> so about 60% into the project, after I'd closed and everything, um, why it actually got to 60% before uh, they realized the problem is another story altogether. But anyway, 60% into it, they found out that the project was a dead stop. The solution I had sold was not even possible to like implement. So um, the company I was with really didn't have the right technical oversight and whatever. But the impact of that is really what I want to focus on here because we think about impact in terms of lost client, lost money, but there's a lot of other impacts that actually hit our agency. Um, so, um, yeah, we do lose clients. So in this case, Pickett's Press did finish out the project with someone else. They were both out of budget and, you know, out of time with us, out of faith with us or whatever. So um, they went a different direction. So we lost that money. I lost the sales commission personally for, for what was left in that project. Um, the project was overall even a loss of money for the company in, as a whole. Um, but the other side of it was that the project manager who was on it, who was the second best project manager that our company had, left the company out of frustration. So we lost, internally we lost, you know, anybody who's lost a very good player in their, in their company, like agencies are, are people, are built out of people. So when you lose somebody like that, it's a big deal. Um, so the other thing that we lost was self-respect, right? So every project that's a failed project, the team has, has a question about like, are we really doing good work? Are we really serving, serving the clients well? Because, you know, obviously that's the heart of, of us in here. So, um, yeah. So um, this, uh, this sort of dynamic has made me realize that um, this is the number one reason why good agencies succeed to fail, or succeed, succeed or fail to thrive. Because like a good and genuine agency can really have a good heart about what they're doing but still fail to thrive and make good margins and, and really have good client success and loyalty um, if they fail at this particular dynamic. So. So let's take it back for a moment. I'm not going to spend time really talking everybody through the PM triangle. We all know the tight-knit relationship between scope, timeline, and budget on projects. We know how critical it is that these three interdependent aspects of a project align. But what's also important to realize is that you know, no matter how well project managers or the sales team do their jobs, there's always going to be a gap between your client's expectations of you know, what they can actually get for their money and in what timeline you can deliver it and the reality of the project delivery. Even if you're very good at managing this triangle, there's going to be a gap. So it's just kind of like a fundamental truth that you know, no matter how happy your client may be with the end result and with the project, they'll always want more. It's kind of human nature. So, you know, it's just important to recognize that there is this gap. It will always be there. And what we need to do is to continually strive to reduce it. We need to bridge the gap. So, um, minding the gap, I think the first thing you start with is there is always going to be a gap. Like in sales, you have, I don't know, maybe in, in our world, 10 hours. To, to figure out a scope for a client and go through that whole process, maybe a little bit more, maybe, maybe a little bit less for depending on the situation. But then you think about when you go through like a discovery, a full-on discovery, the design process, the UX process, how, much, how many hours are actually spent and scoped out for those. That's really when the project kind of comes to its, its um, like final solution. And so there is a big gap. There's always a gap there. And we want to minimize that. We want to, like as on the sales side, we want to actually be pointing out to the client right from the front. It's, it's not fair, really, to the client to not point out that th there is a gap. There's risks there. There's, um, and, and point out where there is risk. Maybe there's some areas where we, we've done a lot of work before. We know that, that that gap is pretty narrow. But in other areas, there's sort of a black hole. We, we don't know, like a data migration or something like that. We really don't know how long it's going to take. So, so we have to like, 
and in the sales process, start prepping the client for that. So in our, um, in our talk, what I think will be useful is if we talk through sort of what are the priorities of each of the parties involved in this process, because I think that, or what I found in my experience anyway, is that a lot of times we don't understand what each other's priorities are, and we just kind of assume that our priorities are everybody's priorities. So just kind of go through and talk about what are the sales priorities so that you project managers in here can start to think about us sales guys in a different light, and then uh, the opposite side, that, um, that we start to understand what's important for a project manager, and the client is, is also included in here. And then finally, um, just going to walk through the, like, what does our handoff process look like, because that's kind of a key point of communication with the client where a lot of stuff can be lost. So, so um, what does a sales guy need? There's a lot of stereotypes about sales guys, right? And a lot of them aren't super positive. So um, uh, maybe greedy comes to mind or dishonest or whatever. But I, I actually believe that sales can be a very honorable profession. And, um, and I think that um, what's important um, to kind of get there is that, first of all, we decide that we're going to be honest and transparent in the sales process. Like, prioritize not just closing the client, but also bringing other, you know, the other aspects into it. And then, um, and then the other thing is really understanding our industries, understanding our clients on the sales side, not just going for the quick and easy close, but actually understanding what are their needs and listening to them during the sales process. More of a consultative approach. Um, so what do sales guys need, um, sales people need? Um, first of all, to sell and to win. Um, so like our bottom line is that we, we have to sell. So it's very important that we're closing business because that's our job, right? And the momentum of a sales department is based a little bit on momentum as well. So winning is really important. Um, so the other thing that's helpful for us, because we're so motivated to, to win and to sell, we need technical oversight. It's not fair to a salesperson to not have that checkpoint in there where somebody who really knows what they're doing is going to walk through this. Because most salespeople are not actually technical folks. They're usually not developers. Maybe a little bit more in the Drupal, Drupal world that a developer actually ends up being the salesperson. But, but still, it doesn't tend to be that way. And then finally, feedback. So what's really, really awesome is if you're able to track so we sell you know, a certain number of hours. We're scoping things out. We expect that things are going to turn out a certain way on the sales side. And then there's the gap. It goes to the project management office, goes through the whole project process. And then there's, there's feedback that can come through and say, well, this project that you sold, this you got right, this you didn't get right. It was way off. And here's why we think we have a discussion around that. So that next time, when a client's saying something to me, it may mean something different than it did before, because I understand, oh, that's actually going to be, there's some risk there that I didn't even understand before, so I get a, a better understanding. So what about the PM? You know, a lot of PMs are experts at juggling lots of different things and kind of working to ensure that projects don't blow up in your face. And those are really important skills to have. But that doesn't really tell us what we need. So the number one thing that PMs need are projects, right? If we don't have any projects to manage, then we kind of don't have anything to do. So that is definitely where we have an interdependent relationship. The sales team has to be selling these projects so that I can then deliver on them. Otherwise, you know, I'm pretty much out of a job. So that part aside, you know, on these projects that we're delivering on, there is definitely an ideal, right? We would all love to have projects that have an ample budget and a realistic timeline, and you know, you can deliver everything that your client needs, and uh, the people are really pleasant to work with, the client is great, your team is happy, you know, and everything just goes according to plan, right? Like, that would be wonderful, but unfortunately, that's not really what happens in, in real life. So, you know, getting out of that ideal, because that's not what happens, the, the things that project managers need in order to be able to succeed on a project are realistic client expectations. It's so, so, so very important that these are set early on so you can deliver on them. It's not fun to be the cold shower for a new client as you're building a relationship with, you know, this new client. Um, 
it's really not fun to be the person who has to tell them, no, actually, we can't do all of this within your budget after they've been sold that exact same thing by other people on your team. So the realist realistic expectations are extremely important. Um, really, it's something that sets the project up for success from the very beginning. Uh, the other thing that project managers need is a full debrief. You know, generally, we're coming on the project after it has been sold. It is the beginning of our relationship with the client, but it's not the beginning of your agency's relationship with the client. And so you need to know what information has previously been exchanged between the sales team and this client. You know, what are the needs that the sales team is aware of? Are there any personality or stakeholder issues on the client side that you should be made aware of? Um, basically, you need you know, a summary of as much information as has been gleaned during the, the sales process. And then the last thing that PMs need is resource availability in, in order to meet the expectations. So that goes for both your team. You need to have the resources to be able to you know, put on this project and actually build it, and design it, whatever is needed for the project at hand. Um, but it also goes for the client. Your client needs to be available and hopefully the sales team has already kind of hinted at that with the client and let them know that you know there's going to be meetings and they're going to have to give timely feedback and, and things like that. So moving on from the PM, you know, we've heard from PM, we've heard from the sales guy. Um, what about the client? Right? They're kind of the third part in this relationship. So having been in the client position in the past, I'm going to put that hat on and tell you a little bit about what clients need. Really, it boils down to wanting to feel that they are in good hands. It's generally quite a long process for a client to get to a point where they are working with you on a project. It starts off you know, as an idea that somebody in their organization has, and you know, they probably have to write it up in various forms and follow you know, internal processes to get this idea approved and for, you know, to the point where they have a budget and you know, it's actually a project that is going to happen and then they're writing up an RFP and they're shopping it out to potential vendors and getting proposals and meeting with them. It's, it's been a long process for them before they actually get to you. So you know, this project, it's really, it's their baby and they want it to be well taken care of. It's really important that they feel they're you know, in good hands. So from their perspective, you know, they, you know, it, what I was just saying about the, the length of that whole process of them getting to you, you know, it's difficult to select a vendor. They've probably talked to a lot of really great uh, really great agencies, they've read through a bunch of different proposals, heard great ideas, but now they've committed to you. And they want to feel that that wasn't a mistake, that they hired the right people. So, you know, they want to know that they made the right decision, they've chosen an expert vendor, and, you know, it's somebody who's going to be able to help them lead their project to success. They want to feel heard and understood. They want clear communication from you know, the sales team and the project delivery team. And then they also need to be able to plan for their business. So that means you know, there could be, perhaps this project means that they're there's a new role that's going to be created. They're going to have to hire somebody new. Well, they're going to have to time that with your project and make sure that maybe it's a content creator, right? That this person has to be hired, trained, and ready to go by the time the site goes live. Or you know, maybe there's other internal processes that need to be changed. Maybe there's a marketing plan that needs to be uh, enacted, PR that's going around, around the site. In any case, they have you know, very real business needs that are, you know, need to be planned in conjunction with this project. So they need to be able to do those together. Um, and then they want continuity in the handoff. They want to feel like they, have, like they are in this, you know, the same good hands with the sales team and with the project team. They don't want to feel like they have to repeat themselves, start over, it's the same relationship for them and it should be, there should be real continuity there. Yeah, so how do we create continuity for, for the handoff so we don't drop the baton in the handoff? Um, so I think it's really important, first of all, that there's a process in place 
and that it's sort of, we're a bit pedantic about the process, so we're using the same documents. We store them in the same places. Um, they have the same sort of format that they go with. Um, uh, meetings that we're having, we're having the same meetings with clients in most places, or similar meetings with similar agendas. And, um, and um, also like the same conference, little things like the same conference uh, software or service that you're using. So if I'm using Google Hangouts, then project management shouldn't, shouldn't use GoToMeeting because the client's having to you know, learn a different process. It's kind of like an omni-channel online. You're trying to think about uh, the client as a user and treat them well at every touch point with the, with the process. So, um, yeah. So, you know, there's two really critical transition tools. There's the communication and the process. We're going to go into the process a little bit more um, in the following minutes. Uh, the process really is about having formal internal communication. Uh, what I want to talk about right now with the communication side of this little equation is kind of your communication with the client. So we already talked about the fact that transparency is very important from the beginning with your clients. Um, and that's, it is really one of our founding beliefs as an agency that we need to be transparent you know, within our team, with our clients. It's just something that we really value. But it's true that it's not the easiest way to communicate. It means that sometimes you have to have really hard discussions. And you may not want to have them, but you still have to. Um, it also can seem a little counterintuitive because you're working hard to sell this, this project to a potential client. It would seem that you should just tell them what they want to hear so that you can make the sale. But that doesn't really set things up for long-term success. You know, making the sale doesn't mean having a successful project or a successful building a successful client relationship and one that will endure, right? You want to build a long relationship. Um, that's what's going to really set your project up for success. Yeah, and on that note um, of communication, um, I've, I've noticed, obviously, there's a, there's a weakness on the sales side to kind of say what the client wants. But I've also noticed on the project management side that a lot of times really hard decision or hard, hard conversations will kind of be put off because it's uncomfortable to talk to the client about it. And so sort of this, this moment when you realize, oh, this thing was sold and, and the expectations are wrong here, like even maybe way off, the budget's wrong. We've, we've come to this point where we realize there's an issue and, and that's in the project management office. That conversation actually, the, the sooner you have it, the better and it is what it is. You, you have to emotionally go through the process of just deciding. To be a good project manager, you have to emotionally decide that hard decisions, okay, maybe you have a conversation internally on how to frame and approach the, the, the conversation with the client before you do that, but as soon as possible, you're communicating to the client so that they, they have a trusting relationship with you, because they're used to this. Clients are used to this. Projects going wrong, things coming up. They know that things come up if they've been around uh, for any time at all. So. Um, so the process overview, I'm just going to kind of, what we're going to do is just jump through the process um, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about like who does what and then go into a little bit more detail about each step of the process and hopefully that's very helpful. Um, okay, so the process, um, so the first thing is, is whenever I get a verbal yes or I start to understand that I'm at 90, 95%, 99% sure that this client's going to close with us, I'm immediately alerting the team to the fact that this, like getting their minds ready, their, them ready to receive a new client. Um, so the next thing is uh, hand off email, um, project one sheet. We'll go in more detail, so I'll just go through this fast. And then uh, part of the process is reading the documentation that I send, um, plan the resources for the project, internal kickoff and external kickoff. So who does what in this process? Let's go over the responsibility breakdown. So, yeah, Kyle. so so I start with the alerting alerting the team as soon as I um, know that I'm pretty close to closing. The idea with alerting is to get uh, the the project delivery team ramped up and ready, almost emotionally ready to receive the client, so that their energy is high when I actually send the handoff email. Um, and then as soon as they close, I'm going to prepare the handoff documentation and send that send that over to the, the delivery team. So as soon as I receive the handoff documentation, 
I need to be making sure that I'm requesting the resources needed for this project, or if I can just directly plan resources, planning them. Um, you know, that ensures that the project is able to start quickly as soon as you know, you've had your kickoff calls and that you can get going. Uh, and then I need to be reading this documentation that Kyle has shared with me, going through everything, you know, writing up any questions that I may have, and ensuring that the team has also read the documentation. So anybody who's going to be active on this project should also be reading through that documentation. Yeah, that's good. As soon as um, she's sort of prepped me on what timelines look like, um, then I can reach back out to the client, let them know what to expect. Again, that's about letting the client kind of stay engaged in the process and have a sense of where we're, we're at internally in this sort of quiet period. And then after that, I would be working to set up first an internal and also a client kickoff call. Um, there may also be an on-site that's needed. Some of you, we're a distributed company, so generally our kickoffs are just via Hangouts, um, but some of you may not be distributed, and maybe all of your kickoffs are on-site. Um, but so if there is an on-site, you'd need to coordinate that, of course, and if there's travel needed, make sure that that's coordinated and scheduled as well. Um, then I would need to prepare and share the meeting agendas for both you know, the internal and the client kickoffs. And then, um, like as a salesperson, it's very easy to disengage at the moment where sort of I've clicked the send button on the handoff email, um, the, the project one sheet's over there. Maybe I've even made an introduction from the client to the project manager, so I know that she's gonna be sending the agenda out and making the calendar invites and stuff. So, so my mind as a sales guy tends to say, check, I'm done, like I can walk away from that, but I kind of encourage that that's not what we do. We actually stay engaged at that point because we come into the, the closing and the handoff in a really high energy because the, the client has finally made a decision. It's, they're exhausted, they've gone through the process. They're really relieved to have found their agency. High energy, high hopes, and the sales guy just made his close, right? So he's really happy as well. Well, the project manager's on the other side juggling all the balls, right? About to receive a new ball to try to juggle. And so the, the energy difference there is a big deal, actually, for between the, the sales side and the project manager. And it's, it's important that I'm making sure that the project manager and the, the delivery team is actually caught on to the fact that this client's coming in and that they're getting their energy to the, the right level that it needs to be to receive that client in the right way. So. And then we both need to attend the kickoff meetings. So I'm gonna talk through the handoff email. Um, honestly, like this may be slightly different for your agency. I'm, I hope you, hopefully it's helpful to just go through this detail and then also the, the project one sheet and these other tools. So uh, one thing I'll say about the email um, is that I, I actually keep an, a template in Google Docs with little subtitles for exactly where to put like each one of these things. So first of all, I remember everything, but second of all, that it's always in the same spot. So the project management and delivery team can sort of count on where they're looking for different information. They get used to it. So it's not an exhaust, like it's a wall of text, right, when they receive this email or the project one sheet. So I wanna make it easy for them to find what, what information they have. So maybe I'll have like the client contact information, the role in the company at the top, um, and, and titled there. So it's easy for them to find client DNA, sort of how the client is, what they should say or shouldn't say with the client. Um, yeah risks there to relationship, is it gonna be an easy client, a hard client, in my expectation, that type of thing. So, and then I'm gonna clearly reference in bullet points every document that they need. So we use Google Docs a lot, so it's easy to link the document, but maybe you're even attaching some documents, but you're still referencing, you're not just attaching them at the bottom of the email, you reference each document so they have a list, a complete list of what they need to look at. Um, quick summary of the project, known risk factors, uh, anything that, that's kind of caught my attention that this needs to be sort of managed carefully or there's gonna be issues there. And then actions and responsibilities. I put this in bold at the bottom of the email and it includes the name of the person who needs to do it. It includes the timeline that they need to do it in because a lot of times I'm assuming <laughs> that they're just gonna catch on to this is a fast deal. I need this kickoff, you know, this documentation read. I need some kind of activity in the next couple of days and they're thinking, well, you know, usually we have five days or two weeks or whatever to kind of get this process going. So it's important to put that to time, of course. 
And then the, the Project One sheet has a lot of the same document. You can go one more, Angie, Ashley. Um, so it's going to have a lot of the same information. Now, we, we use JIRA. So um, this is actually lives in JIRA. So the project team who's constantly using JIRA is accessing this here instead of having to go through a bunch of email to try to find you know, initial information. I'm not going to go through all of this. If you guys do want like, examples of this type of stuff, you can give me your email after this, and we'll make sure that you guys get some examples of, of template documents. Yeah, but so the big thing about the one sheet is we use it more as like a reference document that you would refer back to later on in the project when you're trying to remember, oh, you know, what was the exact budget that came out of the sales process again because we're not there anymore. There's been different, uh, yeah, there's been additional funds or whatever. What was the initial budget? This is where you could find that really easily in one place in our one sheet. So moving on to the internal kickoff then. So when we do internal kickoffs, we tend to use the same agenda. That's what we're sharing here. Um, we want to make sure that we've gathered you know, everybody on the team who is going to have an active role on the project, sales, PM, any developers, you know, UX design, anybody who's, who's going to be working on this project. Uh, the first thing that we want to do is go through a sales overview. So that's where Kyle would just kind of give us you know, the, the quick overview, the summary of this project that he's signed, uh, you know, going over some of the information, probably going over a lot of the information that was already shared in the email, but it's always good to just be reminded of those things. Um, so then after that overview, uh, we'd walk through the project one sheet, just making sure that we're touching again on all of those important things that are in there with budget, timeline, the, you know, client um, stakeholders, any risks that are in the one sheet. Um, kind of main features that are you know expected in this project, et cetera. Then uh, we would have some time for questions and answers around the documentation, because of course everybody on the team has read the documentation when they attend the kickoff, so they all have tons of questions that they've prepared for this meeting because we all attend our meetings being well prepared. So. We would go through those questions, and you know, maybe we're thinking that for this particular problem that the client has, we should use this module, but you know, it's not ready yet in D8, and this is a D8 build. This would be the time to talk through those type of things internally, get on the same page before you meet with your client. Um, and you may find that when you're going through those questions and answers that you don't actually have the answer, and that's okay. That means that that's something that you need to be noting for your client kickoff call. So you're kind of also, through this question and answer, preparing some of that agenda as well. Um, then we would discuss any risks associated with the project. So that module that's not yet ported into D8, that's kind of a risk if we have to use that module. Um, you know, maybe there's risks associated with the timeline. Maybe this is a commerce project and my best commerce developer is you know, going to be on paternity leave for two weeks, at, you know, right at launch. Two weeks, that's a short leave. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, in, in any case, it's important to discuss those risks, you know, in this internal kickoff call, make sure everybody's aware of them. We all, are, you know, know what the issues are. Maybe you're coming up with a plan to solve them already. Maybe not. Maybe it's a big risk and there's going to need to be, you know, some formal mitigation happening. You're maybe not going to have all the answers in this meeting, but at least everybody knows that it's there, that it's a problem, and that you're going to have to deal with it later. Um, then you want to prep for the client kickoff. So just reviewing really quickly any questions that have come out of this that are, you know, that you need to make sure that you're asking in that client kickoff, um, reminding everybody of what that agenda will be, when it's going to be, um, who's probably attending on the client side. And then any action items. Maybe in the Q&A you determined that somebody needs to follow up on or research a particular solution that you talked about. Well, then that would be an action item that you know, you'd sign off on or you'd sign off your meeting with. So um, after then the internal kickoff, we would do a client kickoff. Um, and the agenda for this one is a little bit different. We like to keep these a little bit more informal, I suppose, with our clients. These aren't like 
full-on discovery sessions. It's more getting to know you. You know, so the first thing that we start with is introductions. So we're going to go around the room or you know the hangout thumbnails, and everybody's going to introduce themselves. What do they do? What's their name? And both you know both sides of the table, the client and and your team. Um, then we go through. Uh, a process overview. So just quickly explaining what our process looks like, what are going to be the different steps on this project, um, you know, more or less, you know, what's going to happen when, uh, so that the client knows what's coming next. So we don't generally go into tons of detail about the process. There are a lot of PMs in the room. I'm sure you all like to talk about process as much as I do. I don't do that in this meeting. It's more of just an overview because not everybody in the meeting needs that level of detail. I generally then will follow up and do just a specific, like a PM process one hour call with whoever is uh, kind of managing the project on the client side. But maybe the president of their company doesn't need to know that level of detail about the process of the project. Um, so it's just an overview here. Then, um, then we do you know quick project overview. So that's again kind of just touching on the main points that are in that are in our one sheet or that were in the initial uh, email from from Kyle. So you know just this is the budget. This is the timeline. Um, who are the key stakeholders? Uh, making sure that you're asking your client as well. You know are there any important deadlines or any times where you're going to be unavailable that we're not yet aware of? It's a good time to bring that up and, and get that information out there. So uh, yeah, just going over the general overview of this project. Then we, at the end, well towards the end of, of these kickoff meetings, we do then kind of turn it into more of a discovery session where we like to start with the question of, you know, please define wild success for us. What is wild success for this project? And just get that feedback from the different, uh, from the different stakeholders that are in attendance on the client side. And some really interesting answers can come out of that. Um, sometimes you may have somebody who hasn't really been involved in the whole sales process, but you know they're somebody's boss, and so they're in this meeting just you know as a bit of a, a courtesy and you know to show them, hey, look, we're kicking off this project. So it can be interesting to get that person's point of view. And maybe you didn't already have it. Um, in any case. Uh, Asking that, asking these questions around, you know, what is success, and kind of turning the end of the call into uh, the, your first uh, discovery session, also allows then your UX, uh, your, your your UX designer who's on the call to uh, to start preparing sketches for the next call that you're going to have with the client. That's going to give them some of that initial feedback that they're going to pull into their very first sketches. Um, so then after you've done kind of the discovery questions, a little bit of you know, defining success, then the last thing would be, what are our next steps? So you'd explain you know, when the next meeting is going to be, who's going to be needed on it, what's happening before that meeting. So for us, that would be that the UX uh, strategist is going to go and work on some sketches based on what we've heard here today. We're going to share those with you. We'll be you know, uh, iterating on them uh, after that. But We'll share them with you in a meeting in about a week, um, get some initial feedback, et cetera. So that is kind of everything that we'd go through in our meeting, uh, in our meeting agenda for our client kickoff. So, um, well, I was going to summarize a little bit here. Um, oh, sorry. So it is actually, um, we, we really do believe that this is a number one reason why um, agencies, good agencies, um, succeed or fail to thrive. It's a big deal. We feel like transparency is super important. Process is really important. Um, quick communication with the client. Trusting relationships for lawyer. Like we're just humans working together ultimately, and so it's important that we work with respect for each other. So, um, so hey Ashley, I, uh, I I got a verbal yes on a, an upcoming project today. Really? Great news, yeah. That is great news, Kyle. Can you tell me some more about it? Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't really want to worry you too much about it right now. I just wanted to alert you to, to the fact that the client's coming your way. It'll maybe be another week before we sign or so, and then I'll prepare the handoff documentation just like, uh, like you'll be expecting it. So. Great. So I can receive that email with all the documentation in like a week or so once it's yeah, timed? You know, yeah, you know, don't worry about it too much because I'll, I'll send it over in the time. I just wanted to get you starting to think about the project. 
and then you know you'll know exactly when to, to get things going and you know what the process is from there. So great. I'm excited about the new project. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, <laughs>
and then you run into a crisis. Yeah, so the question is if you have a crisis on your project, who's dealing with that crisis? Is it the CEO of your company? Is it the sales team that coming back in? Is it your project delivery team? Um, so hopefully if a crisis happens, hopefully it doesn't, but if it does, um, hopefully you've built up enough trust and enough client rapport and a relationship between the project team and the client that it can mostly be handled with the project team. Of course, sometimes you're going to have clients who are going to want to see you know, the CEO, like you know, the founder, the step in. Um, that, that's okay. If that makes them feel better, if it's gonna bring the crisis to resolution, fine. You know, the, the end goal there is for you to find some sort of resolution where everybody's happy. So, um, and, and you know, if perhaps the sales team has maintained a relationship with this client once it was sold, you know, they've been in contact a couple of times, yeah, there's no reason why the salesperson can't come back in and help, help come to a resolution. I mean, I think definitely the more people you have working on the problem and trying to resolve it together, the better your chances are of a successful resolution. No matter where you are in the process, um, whether you're in sales or in the project management side of things, um, the more you sweep stuff that should be talked about under the rug, the more it's going to come up later, right? So if you have developed a relationship with the client where you're honestly dealing with them and something happens, that's where you can point back to points where you said, listen, I did warn you about this risk. I'm sorry. You know, it's, so there is some, something there to not sweeping things under the rug because it does come back to bite more often than not, right? Um, and ultimately, sometimes in telling the truth and having this kind of relationship with your clients, you lose your clients. But you don't lose your self-respect, right? And that's what's most important because in the end, you can keep your head high, right? And you know that you're not internally battling with your own lies and your own sort of uh, cowardice or whatever it is. So, you don't act like a manager throughout the whole project? Well, I, I actually do. Um, I understand that some agencies run a little bit differently, so that some agencies actually have an account management office, and so th there isn't a, like a clear answer. It just depends on how your agency works. But I, I always want, I actually want to continue the relationship, and if there's a problem, I kind of want to get pulled back in so I can keep the rapport and uh, I don't know, keep my dignity or something. I don't know. Yeah. Hi, uh, I really appreciate your comment about uh, trying to equalize out the energies between an incoming mm -hmm. client who's yeah. super excited, super jazzed, and a PM who's juggling a lot of things. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm actually a, a fellow misunderstood and a whole salesperson, but um, <laughs> I'd like to, I'm, I'm curious how you, when, when handing off, and just speaking to the sensitivity of a project manager, um, when handing off a project, um, what kind of tools do you use to make sure that someone who is already juggling a lot of projects already isn't overloaded? Do you have a forecasting type of tool for the opportunities coming up? And uh, you know, do you have meetings to get on the same page about resources, potential resources being allocated? Uh, not just for how many balls can a PM juggle, but just mm -hmm. the actual developers who might be on the, yeah. the task? Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think we, we do a weekly tactical meeting. Um, and in that, we report uh, one of the one of the checklist items, or is it a metric? Anyway, one of the items that we report on in our weekly tactical meeting is uh, number of incoming leads, number of proposals that have been sent out, any important clients that are close to closing. So we would already be aware of anything that's coming in, um, you know, hopefully at least a couple of weeks out. Sometimes we've been hearing about it, you know, for a month or two when they're like, oh, we got this new lead, and then a month later, oh, we sent a proposal, and then, oh, it's really starting to sound good, we have another meeting. So. The PM hopefully has, is aware of it because of the tactical meetings that we have. Um, and then as far as kind of the projections and, and the resource availability, we, once a project is very close to signing, and we define close by like, you know, 75%, we're pretty sure they're gonna sign, like we've had, the you know, proposal has been sent, we've had a couple of meetings, it's looking really good. Um, we include it in our projections, so we have, this, it's a crazy detailed spreadsheet that I love, everybody else is afraid of, um, but it's, we call it the mega sheet. I came up with that awesome name. Um, it has all the projects and we use that for projections. So it's basically like calculates your velocity that you need for UX, for UI, for your developers, how many people you're gonna need and we then kind of can project out the resources and we've recently added like the actual people so we can look and see like, okay, like this person can't be running these three projects, they're all at the same time, that doesn't work. 
So yeah, we have ways of kind of projecting that and, and making sure that we're not overloading our team or over capacity with something that's coming in from sales. So I, I am losing, um, losing hope in the uto utopian kind of wish that everything could even out in an agency <laughs> and uh, you know everything like would just, just work. It seems like it's feast or famine a little bit. So you're bringing in clients and it's always too busy or you know, you're a little thin. And I don't, I don't know exactly how to even that out. And I really, I don't even know if you can. What you can do is just be as responsible as possible. When you bring the client in, you're letting them know as much as possible, you know, what the timeline might be. But obviously, you don't know if they're going to close. And so you're making promises into air. You've got your, and, and the truth is that they're aware of that as well. I mean, so some junior, junior clients, some like maybe new to, new to the web or something may be surprised by this. Smaller, smaller businesses may be surprised by this, but if they're, um, if they're at all know about you know, web projects and agencies, they're gonna know that they've, they've gotta deal with this. And I don't know, it's something that you can just, just be confident that every agency deals with this instead of feeling like you're the only one in the world who does it, right? So, yeah. Two questions. Um, I know you're working with Ashley now, but who's your second favorite favorite PM that you've ever worked with? Uh, and we know the right answer. Is that, that a question. leading question? <laughs> it is. Uh, so, so my real question, Kyle uh, and Ashley, when you're working in such a, I, I know both of you are remote from each other. Um, how do you keep the pace of conversation that's necessary for PMs and sales to have, you know, while talking about clients, making sure all those needs are conveyed between both parties? Uh, be, beyond kickoff, things pop up in your mind, and do you write them down, or do you immediately ping each other? How do you how do you combat the the remote worker syndrome? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we are a remote company, um, as many of us are. So, hip chat is one good way. I yeah, yeah, I think the general way of bringing up anything that kind of just pops into mind, like oh, I really have to tell so and so, we just it, p uh, yeah, we ping them in hip chat. Um, I find it better to do that immediately and even so we're distributed and we're kind of all over the world so people may or may not be online and so I don't really even worry about whether or not whoever I need to talk to is online I just send the PM and they will read it right we're all kind of used to working that way so it works um, I find that better than keeping like a list of things that I have to remember to ask you be yeah. yeah 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 no um, I think that um, one thing to remember is just an agency is made of people. And so who you hire and who's working on the team uh, is really important. So you're, you're looking for quality. If the quality isn't there, if they're not remembering and reaching out, there's an issue. So like if, if the ball's getting dropped an awful lot, then it's sort of important to kind of check in and see why, you know, why the ball's getting dropped. Um, I would say that keeping each other accountable, having that kind of culture where it's okay to approach each other and say, hey, listen, I mentioned this to you and nothing happened. Why not? If we can't do that with each other, then we're not going to grow. So it's really important. And I think that that really has a lot to do with that communication thing. Because a lot of times, um, there's a real good reason. We're either overworked or there's a real responsibility problem or maybe even a personal work issue going on there. Because there's plenty of ways to communicate these days. So. Hello, Maria. I have a question about the transition plan uh, and when does it happen? You mentioned that it happens after the deal is closed. What does it mean the deal is closed? Do you have a contract sign or you have an okay from the client? And if there is a contract sign, most likely there will be scope in there, timeline, cost, uh, resources. Isn't it too late to change that when it goes to the PM and it's already signed? Yeah, um, it is. And who does that contract and all of that information in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so. The, that's, it's a big it question that you're asking. It depends on the type of project. <laughs> so. Yeah, I don't think the mic was picking you up. But okay, yeah. So yeah. So when the deal is closed, does it mean that there is a contract in place, or there is just an okay from the client, and who put together the contract, uh, including scope, timeline, um, resources, cost, everything that goes into the contract? Uh, because my assumption is, if the contract is signed and it's a done deal, and it's very difficult to change things after that or at least a lot of people can be unhappy. Yeah. <laughs> so it definitely depends on the type of clients that you're working with and, and the agency that you're working with as well. Um, because some clients are going, like 
you know, nonprofits or government, for example, may have specific contracts that you have to work with. Like you can't bring your own contract to the table and have them sign that. Um, a lot of our clients do use our contract. And so our contract does not tie us in to a specific timeline or scope. We are a time and materials agency. So we note in the contract that we are aware of the RFP, of the, of the proposal, of any you know, information that has been exchanged about you know, the budget mm -hmm. and the timeline. But that, like it basically says in the contract, these things are all gonna change once we get working mm -hmm. with you. And so we're gonna redefine this as we, as we continue working. Um, so that works perfectly fine with time and material. It works in our situation, yes. If, if it's a fixed bid, if every, all of those details are already in the contract, then it is true that you are probably not going to be able to do much to change things uh, once the project has been sold. And in that case, I would definitely say that you'd need to beef up the kind of sales uh, communication with the people on your team who are uh, you know, providing estimates who are actually, so, so that whatever is contracted at that point is going to be as close as possible to reality. One thing you may consider doing is rather than having a contract for the whole engagement, you may think about it in, in terms of like steps along the way. So maybe like a $5,000 engagement to verify everything that you think is true. So you're signing a contract still, but there's an expectation that at the end of it, you're gonna have to verify the scope and everything. That makes it a little more comfortable for the client to, to bite on that and go ahead and move forward because maybe they like to work with you, but um, there's still, we gotta figure out a way to get things started, right? So you, you mm -hmm. cut that down quite a bit so you get a chance to work together and then move from there. But typically it's gonna start when the contract's signed. And if not, I mean, if you're trying to get a perfect scope before you start, how many hours are you willing to, to spend on that? That's an agency decision. Different agencies come up with different points. Uh, but it different can get points. into this uh, circle where the client would not sign until you give them the final budget because they have a budget. And for them to agree into getting into that contract, uh, you need to give them a fixed price. So yeah, yeah, that's right. And, it, and it's an agency decision Am I going to work with that type of client or not? Now there is like there is a big deal. I don't know like how much you guys have sort of been aware in the SaaS in the SaaS based world because you guys are all open source. Um, in the SaaS based world, people are willing to put a lot more time into exploration because if they manage to close the deal, then they get a, they get a client for a very long time. And they kind of have an expectation of what the lifetime value is for that client. In open source, you're doing a lot up front in order to hopefully close them. But if it goes wrong, they can quit you just like that, right? So you do less upfront, typically in open source, and you should be able to communicate that. That's part of understanding your industry. Say, listen, this is open source. I know maybe like if they are working with SaaS, they have time because you can explain that to your client. We don't have that kind of time because we lose every bit here. So we have to basically, we have to be paid for what we do because we, you know, whatever. So does that make thank sense? You. Yeah, thank you very much. It's not an easy answer for what you're saying. It's, it's, a, it's a very complex decision to be made. So. We have about two minutes left. You were waiting before, yeah. Firstly, I apologize for my voice. I lost it on the way here, not party. Beautiful. On the way here. So um, secondly, this is a brilliant presentation. Thanks. I think all of us as PMs feel a little relief to hear all of these things and know where the gaps are. And definitely I find um, when working that the gap seems to hit it at handoff. And so I really like the process that you've displayed, but it's ideal, that's yeah. ideal. And often we get five friggin' minutes to download that handoff before we get it as PMs and then have to start resourcing and having sending off the kickoff and, and sales, um, who also are sales account managers, they want to deliver. They want to yeah. deliver. And they're pushing us and they want it. They want that meeting. They want the internal kickoff. They want the audit. They want it. They want it. They want it. They want it now. And so we all know that that ends up at the what the F, which I just read your blog, it was fantastic, oh, on thanks. estimating through. Um, how do you guys deal with that? And just opine about what happens to a project when, when the handoff isn't done, because that, it's like a one-page document, but it is yeah. so important. First, just a quick, I'm gonna give my quick perspective on this, and that is that this all lends back to agency culture. So if the executives have decided that sales are more important, than yeah. servicing the client, then they're gonna prioritize sales over whatever. And if the executives have made that decision, 
there's very little you can do about that unless you can convince them otherwise, right? That's why I say this is the number one reason why good agencies, you know, succeed or fail to thrive because you have to be client focused and decide that that's the most important thing in your delivery before you're gonna. So if, you, if you're working for an agency where they're just pushing you and it's the executive all the way to the top and they won't see reason how this is, is hurting the client relationship and slow the process down and create a reasonable environment for you, then that's a personal decision as well. Because you, you have your own personal self-respect. Right, no, no, I, I don't even know what agency you work for. I'm just, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm like, this is a problem in every agency I'm with, right? That pressure point, but it is actually a culture decision. Like, you have, to, you have to decide that the client is the most important, and if the client's the most important, then a good handoff process is, is paramount. Well, Kyle would never do that to me. Um, so one thing that one thing that could help is so maybe just a quick conversation with the sales to say how long did it take you to read through this documentation that you received, and then you know they can give you an estimate. Oh, it took you about two hours. Great, I'm going to block two hours in my calendar and in everybody on the team's calendar so that we can actually read through this documentation. And until we have that meeting is spent, you know, going over detail, you know, going over details that were in the documentation, which, I mean, of course, you are summarizing what's in the documentation, but, you know, it's, it's essentially a bit of a waste of time, right? If it's really important to be prepared and to actually know what the project at hand is and come with your questions because other, you know, those questions are going to just come up later then. Um, so yeah, I would maybe, if, you're, if you have a bit of a difficult relationship, they're not understanding the need to have enough time to read the documentation, ask them how long it took them, and block the time. Just block it in your calendar and say, well, you can see my calendar. This is when I next have two hours to read through it, so maybe we can do our internal kickoff then, you know, two days after that or whatever when we all have availability. Um, as far as projects that have poor transitions, so, I mean, you can kind of right the ship there, you know, you can still come out on top and have a successful project, but it's going to be harder, you know, because, I mean, essentially what it is is just kind of a big risk, right? If you didn't have a good transition, then a lot of key information that was probably already given to your agency in the sales process hasn't been, hasn't been communicated to your delivery team. So when three months later you find out that the client is, you know, going on vacation for a month, well, you know, that could be a huge risk to your project, you know. So um, I suppose if the transition isn't great, you're not getting the information from sales, then the backup plan would be to just do that much more, that much more detailed communication with the client and kind of at the very beginning of the project. Um, if you're not getting it from sales, then you have to get it from somewhere so, so that the project can still be successful. But what that's going to hurt is the client relationship because you don't have that, you know, that continuity that we were talking about where they feel heard they, because you know, they're repeating themselves and they have to like, kind of start all over and rebuild this relationship, and that's not cool for them. Um, so the project can still be a success, but it may hurt the, the relationship uh, with the client, and maybe you won't have that you know, longer relationship that you're hoping to build um, a, as a result of the poor transition. So, yeah. So, yeah, sorry, I think we're out of time. <laughs>